Good evening. I'm Marilyn Heron, director of the Rogers Center for Holocaust Education and Stern Chair in Holocaust Education at Chapman University. Welcome to the first in our fall series of events sponsored by the Rogers Center. The last months have challenged us in ways we could never have imagined a year ago. Each day reminds us of both the fragility of life and the strength of the human spirit. Technology makes it possible for us to meet as we are this evening, while simultaneously underscoring how much we miss being together on the Chapman campus. The theme for this year's Rogers Center events is sharing strength, sustaining humanity. Those who survived the Holocaust often say that no one survived on their own. By sharing their meager strength, whether through an encouraging word or a morsel of bread, they demonstrated that their oppressors could not rob them of their humanity. Both of our events this semester speak to moral courage during times of racism, bigotry, and anti-Semitism, when humanity itself was under attack. Tonight, we are honored to present the powerful and moving documentary, Olympic Pride, American Prejudice. The film tells the story of the 18 black athletes who were on the US team for the 1936 Summer Olympics in Berlin, Germany. Defying Jim Crow laws and Nazi racism, these outstanding young men and women demonstrated both courage and dignity. They consistently embodied the very essence of humanity. Before I introduce our speaker, a few words about the format for this evening's event. We will be viewing the film, which runs about an hour and 20 minutes on Vimeo. The link will be posted in the chat box along with the access password. Please stay connected to Zoom. Please stay connected to Zoom when you open Vimeo in your web browser. This will allow you to ask questions using Zoom's Q&A feature. After the film concludes, we will continue the evening in Zoom with your questions for Deborah Riley Draper. If you have issues accessing the film or using the Q&A feature, please reach out via the chat box and we'll do our best to provide support. The discussion with Deborah Riley Draper will be recorded and posted online later this week. To introduce the film, joining us from Atlanta, Georgia, is the film's director and writer, Deborah Riley Draper. In 2016, Variety named Miss Draper one of the top 10 documentaries. And after you see tonight's film, you'll understand why. Her debut film, Versailles 73, American Runway Revolution, Open New York Fashion Week in 2012. A former advertising executive, Ms. Draper is the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including two regional Emmys. And now, even though it's only virtually, it's my pleasure to present Deborah Riley Draper. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you so much for inviting me, Dr. Heron. It's such an honor to be here and an honor to be virtually a part of the Rogers Center for Holocaust Education. Um, this film was really important to make, to write and direct and to bring to the consciousness of uh, everyone. In 1936, it was an election year. It was a time of political upheaval on both sides of the Atlantic. And there were 18 brave African-American students, some young, some teenagers, um, who decided 
that they would represent themselves, their country, their culture, and their race in a fight to establish representation and visibility. 18 African Americans defying Jim Crow and defying Hitler to win hearts and medals at the 1936 Summer Olympic Games. There are so many lessons that we can learn from these courageous, patriotic young people. There are so many lessons that we can learn about ourselves and how we stand up for what is right, for what is good, for what is moral. And that's what these young people did. They teach us a great lesson in understanding humanity in demonstrating and showing empathy and reaching to other people who may not look like yourself and being a friend, being a colleague, being a teammate. Those are the things that we can learn from the 18 African Americans. We may not know their names, we may not recognize their faces, but the spirit of what they did should live in all of us because they are part of American history, of sports history, of world history. And with that, I'd love to present to you Olympic Pride, American Prejudice. Enjoy the film, and immediately following the film, I will be back with Q&A. Thank you. All right, welcome back, everyone, after seeing this really moving and powerful and and informative film. Um, our discussion with the director and writer, Deborah Riley Draper, uh, is gonna begin in just a couple of minutes. Uh, so if you have not done so, if you could please take a moment to send your questions uh, to the chat box and the associate director of the Rogers Center, uh, Jessica Milamuk, is going to uh, moderate uh, the Q&A. But I'm, we'll, we'll hold for just a minute or two here and uh, then to give everyone time to put in their, uh, their questions and also to uh, finish seeing the film because I know people started at uh, somewhat different uh, times. I'll, uh, I'll lead off with a question myself. So um, we'll give it just a, a couple minutes here. So, Deborah, welcome back. <laughs> Hi. Thank, thank you for sharing this really outstanding and such a thought provoking and moving uh, documentary. So, I know people are coming back uh, to Zoom at a, somewhat different times, uh, to in terms of when they were able to start looking at the film. So, I thought I might just start off myself with a question or two and uh, Jessica will meanwhile moderate the questions that are coming into the uh, uh, chat room. Um, I wonder, first of all, if you could just say a little bit about what brought you to this material, especially given the fact your first film, Versailles 73, was very different in terms of content from this. So how did, how did you first become so enthralled and impassioned about, about, about these stories as, as we can sense you are by, by viewing the film? Thank you so much. First, um, Dr. Heron, I wanna say thank you to you and your entire team and for the center for doing this. Um, what struck me about these 18 athletes is what struck me also about tonight's program. In times, uh, tough times and difficult times, you have to step out and do something different. And you may be the first, right? And you may not be heralded for it. You may not even be remembered for it. But um, I think it's critically important to do it. So I thank you for creating uh, this opportunity through a virtual forum uh, to bring everyone together in our virtual collaborative screening room uh, to share this experience. Because as a filmmaker, it's a very um, important and a moment we honor when people take the time out of their day to spend it, to watch something you create. Um, I was first introduced to this film because I was watching uh, the story and, and through different articles, Valeda Snow, she was an African-American woman 
from uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I read an article about her. She was interned um, in a Nazi labor camp, and I didn't know Black women were interned mm -hmm. at, 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 at all. And, and, and certainly, I didn't uh, know her story. And so she was a jazz player. Obviously, um, she was in a jazz club playing degenerate music, and she was swept up and, uh, and, and taken and put into a camp. And she was there about a year and a half. And when she returned to New York, uh, she was interviewed by the Amsterdam News. And she said, man, I wish I had left <laughs> when those 18 African-Americans uh, left in 36 on that boat back to America. And I was like, what 18 African-Americans? Who could she be um, referring to? Obviously, I knew Jesse Owens, um, but I didn't know the other 17. I didn't know the two women, Tidy Pickett and Louise Stokes. I didn't know Mac Robinson was the older brother of Jackie Robinson, and he was on this team and won a silver medal. I didn't know Tuskegee Airman Archie Williams won a gold medal in the 36 Olympics uh, before he returned to represent his country um, during World War II. I had no concept of these heroes, of their story, of the uh, debate that went on in this country. And it was uh, a very volatile debate that went on. And there were people who understood and knew what was going on ger in Germany. There were people who denied it. And there were people who didn't know. And the parallels to right now are just so incredibly powerful. Um, but that's how I, I was introduced to the story. And once I saw these athletes and what they sacrificed to get there and what they had to go through to be elite athletes in college in the 1930s as African-Americans when they're only two, maybe even one generation away from slavery and now they're competing on an international stage. I was smitten and I was honored um, to be able to tell their story and introduce the world to these powerfully, incredibly smart athletic people. Thanks, Deborah. I, I should add that um, you've also written a book and both the, the book I'll put on my salesperson garb because I want as many people as possible to be able to see this film and also have a chance to read some of the stories that are told at a little more length in your book. So both uh, the film and the book are available through uh, through Amazon and, and I hope a lot of people will decide to add these to, the, to their, their personal libraries. So I'm going to ask just one more question before we uh, turn it over to some of the other uh, questions that have come in. But if you were to kind of step back and say, I can't believe I really just learned that, what would have been the, the what was the most astounding um, fact or story or, or whatever you want to choose that came to you through your research on the film? Um, you know what? I, I think absolutely everything I learned was astounding. Uh, I, I think I, I'll start in order. I think learning that Adolf Hitler looked to American eugenics um, to inspire for lack of a better word, but to inform a lot of his, his decisions, especially around the Nuremberg laws and especially around sterilization. I, I think American eugenics, eugenics has been around a long time, but the American version of it is, is a big part of what he took from what America was doing in race science at the time. So I think I was astounded by that. And, and I was astounded by the sheer number of sterilizations that happened in America. Um, that would be the first fact. As it relates to these athletes, I was astounded that there were 18 of them because I thought there was only one. The dominant narrative of the 1936 Olympics pitted Jesse Owens against Adolf Hitler. So it was this single exclusive African-American um, and the rest of them faded into the woodwork. And I was astounded as to how can these super talented, super smart people's story get lost in history and completely disappear, especially uh, Tuskegee Airmen, 
especially Ralph Metcalf, a US congressman, the gentleman who wrote the resolution for Black History Month. So, um, and, and most importantly, I was heartbroken that Tidy Pickett and Louise Stokes were not recognized for the pioneering female sports heroes that they were. These were female athletes, elite athletes in the 30s, well before Title IX, right? So, so they brought so much uh, to the table in terms of breaking barriers and, and creating lanes and opportunities for generations of women that follow. Well, as you know, we have a terrific film school that Chapman has just gone up to number four. And I hope that the stories that you've told will inspire other people, our students, uh, to, to tell some of those stories that, you know, we just see the first little bit of the thread and, and there is so much more uh, to tell about really every one of these 18 amazing people. Yeah. So, I, all right, well, I will ask Jessica then to uh, share one or more of the questions that have come in. There are lots of great questions. I wanna thank everyone who's posted a question. These are really great, smart questions um, and I'm ready to, to dive right in. <laughs> okay, great. Hello. Um, hi. So, hi. <laughs> um, so I actually have a, a question from Marisa and she quoted the film. So I want to start with this one because it's a, a thought provoking quote where she said, um, she thinks that the quote is, my racist country is better than your racist country. Um, and that it kind of encapsulates so much of this film. So her question was, can you touch on the local legacies of the athletes and their lives after? And then she also, of course, said, thank you for being here. Yes, in the epilogue of the film, you'll you'll see a little bit about their their local legacies, and obviously, if you get the book Olympic Pride and American Prejudice, we deep dive into what uh, what they brought to the table. But for example, um, as I said, uh, Ralph Metcalf, who's a 1932 Olympian and a 1936 Olympian, became a congressman from Illinois, and he was the founder of the Congressional Black Caucus and wrote the resolution for Black History Month. Uh, that, that is amazing. Archie Williams became uh, an incredible Tuskegee Airman. He served in the Air Force um, until he retired and then became a computer science teacher. Dr. James Louval, uh, who, if you go to UCLA, if you're, if you, and, I, and I know you're Chapman, but if you walk over to UCLA anytime soon, you'll see the Laval Commons and it was named after Dr. James Louval, who also held a tremendous number of patents at Kodak. He, he received his PhD. He was a physicist, he was an engineer, and incredibly smart. Um, Tidy Pickett became a principal. She taught school and she became a principal. Louise Stokes, um, she created something really incredible. She created the Colored Women's League for bowling. So these experiences touch them all in different ways. But I think it's really interesting that Louise created a safe space for black female athletes to be able to compete and to be able to be free of some of the marginalization that happened to her. So I think that's outstanding and, and I think it's remarkable. They're all remarkable. You know, Mac Robinson, Think about being the big brother to Jackie Robinson, having your little brother see you have the courage to go to Nazi Germany and stand on a podium with swastikas overhead and take your medal. The, the courage, sometimes there's great courage and being able to stand tall and that is the representation that is the demonstration of breaking through. Um, you know, sometimes the power is in the silence and the power is in the presence. And, and I think that's what these 18 athletes represented. They're being on the medal stand, they're being in Germany, they're being in the opening ceremony, their presence on the boat over sends an incredibly powerful message. And, um, and, and courage and conviction are the two things that come to mind. 
I actually have a, another question, um, and I don't have a name associated with this one, but somebody had asked, um, they'd noted that in the film that the year of death for some of the athletes is actually listed as unknown. And they were wondering why, you know, what happened when were they last seen? Why aren't they on record? Um, well, you know, here, here's the thing. Um, lots of record keeping entities in the 30s, 40s, 50s, dating back to a practice that happened during slavery did not have accurate record keeping of African Americans. So it's actually not unusual to not have a definitive birth or date for African Americans of that time. Um, the, you know, these, these boxers returned home uh, just like many African American veterans in World War I and World War II. And, and you're unable to find out what happened to them. So those two boxers, uh, we did find out the death of, of Howell King. He did die in 1956, but we didn't know that. We couldn't find that anywhere. And, and fortunately, some smart woman, uh, not unlike Dr. Heron, it, that decided to screen this film, screened it. And someone watching was a cousin of Howell King and emailed us and told us. So, but we leave it there because it is to uh, signal and flag that sometimes we don't value life and we don't value the lives of all of our American citizens um, and everyone's important and we need to know the details of our collective history and the lived experiences of everyone. It's valuable and important. And I have a question that's actually two really good questions from the same person. So I'm just going to throw them back out there for you. Um, the, the first one is from your research. And this is our friend Joyce um, wanted to know, why do you think Jesse Owens was recognized more than his other fellow 17 African American athletes? And then she also asked a really good question, which I think is, which I would like to know the answer to, um, which is that uh, the, the title of your uh, documentary um, that there, oh, maybe it wasn't her, maybe somebody else. It's a compelling um, title to your film. And so they were wondering why you chose this title and maybe maybe you could share with us some of the other titles you've considered. Uh, I don't remember any of the other titles we considered, honestly. Um, and uh, the, I mean, you know, here's the thing. The, this is a dichotomy, right? It's kind of a, uh, when you're in the ring, when you're winning, when you're an athlete representing the country, everyone has tremendous pride for your accomplishments. But when you step off the track, when you step off the court, when you step off uh, whatever that podium is that uh, represents champion or winning, the prejudice immediately returns. Your black body often becomes a threat again, or the idea that you were special disappears. Um, so this is much like uh, the duality of being African-American and American in this country, because, uh, I, and I feel it myself, on, on, on any given day, I can be at a podium speaking, but outside I may make someone feel uncomfortable. My mere presence uh, may, may feel to them a threat. So that's the prejudice oftentimes attributed to someone of color. But um, in the moment of signing a book or screening the film, there's great pride that we all feel. So that Olympic pride, American prejudice, is what happened to these 18 heroes. They were the pride of the moment, but the institutionalized racism of America impacted them all. And, and so I think I think that has a lot to do with it. You know, obviously pride and prejudice is a play, uh, you know, play on those words, but the power in this is around when you are a part of winning, you're recognized. When you step off that stage, uh, you often become a menace just that fast um, in the eyes of some people. Who, ca who carry certain fears and carry certain uh, misconceived notions with them. And uh, in terms of Jesse Owens, it, it's, it's, it's the story of the exceptional one, right? Jesse is a, an incredible athlete. His uh, feats were extraordinary, but it was also part of the dominant narrative of the media to pit a single African-American against Hitler, because that's a better story. 
Because if you tell the story of 18 exceptional African Americans, then you're going to start to destroy this whole notion of second class citizenship. You destroy the notion of inferiority. Uh, a single person becomes, this is like a one in a million thing, it's an anomaly. Um, so being able to tell the story of the anomaly versus to tell the story of, oh my God, there's scores and scores and millions of people who are incredible um, from a certain race, it, it, it takes down what the dominant narrative is built around. Um, and shout out for, to Barbara Rosen for uh, letting everyone know that Drake High School, which is where Archie Williams uh, was teaching computer science after he retired from the Air Force, is considering renaming that high school, the Archie Williams High School, um, and changing the name from Drake High School. So thank you for sharing that, Barbara. Uh, one of our other guests had said, uh, one thing that really struck me was those that were sent home without participating due to race, such as Stokes, the two boxers, the Jewish athletes. Do you know of any journalists at that time who actually covered the, the inequities at that time, not kind of now looking back on it? Um, the, the, the Black newspapers did. Um, but, but obviously they didn't have the reach and frequency of a mainstream newspaper, but that, that's, that's the reason why we know about these stories because uh, great historians and archivists at uh, archives and universities around the world have actually digitized some of those assets from that period. So we're able to see the coverage, um, but you look at an Amsterdam News or Chicago Defender or Pittsburgh Courier, those were not papers that reached uh, the large percentage of America, but those papers did reach a large percentage of African American households. So that information was there and we were able to see that they covered this story and it was an important story for them to cover. And they ran the point home too, which was great. Um, I think we have time for just a couple more questions, um, if you're willing to stick with us. Um, the, you know, let's take all of the ones that were put there because people took the time to do it. If we have time, I have time. Okay. Um, so I did have one where somebody had asked if there was anyone who was hesitant to be interviewed for the documentary. Um, you know, I, I, I think the folks that we asked, I don't think there was uh, very much hesitation. If, as I recall, people were excited to tell a story. The family members waited 80 years to have this story told and to be recognized. There were a couple people we asked who were um, previous athletes that didn't wanna participate in the film, but they were busy and had schedule conflicts and things like that, but the families were really excited. Um, and, and we're so grateful we told the story. Obviously the, the film uh, created an opportunity for very, uh, a, a ton of the family members to be recognized by President Obama in conjunction with this film at the White House. So in 2016, uh, President Obama recognized these 18 athletes and their contributions. That was the first time they were recognized as a collective. Um, 80 years they waited for that moment. None of them were alive, but their families were there to accept that honor. So I, um, the small part that uh, Coffee Bluff Pictures was able to play in that. We will all cherish that. As the writer, director, I cherish that moment because that is shining the light on people who really deserved it and, and people who did something great and whose work changed the lives of generations to come. And people don't even know that. It's the civil rights movement. That, that was a moment that's the precursor to being able to tear down separate but equal and be able to demonstrate what access allows you to accomplish. I have two questions about Jesse Owens for you. Um, the first one is that um, the many people know or have been told that Hitler did not shake Jesse Owens' hand yet Jesse Owens maintains that he did. So do you happen to know the truth? Um, and then the other one is um, that's, that uh, somebody had read a story that in the long jump, Jesse Owens faulted on his first two attempts 
and that a German long jumper advised him to take a step back um, so that he would qualify and eventually he won the gold. Do you know anything, had you heard anything about that story in your research? The second story is true. Um, the, the first story, what was printed in the newspapers was that uh, Hitler snubbed Jesse Owens. It was actually Cornelius Johnson and Dave Albritton because that came out on the first day of the games. Jesse didn't have any competitions on the first day of the games. This, it was a high jump. Jesse, uh, you know, was a long jumper. So um, that, that was Dave Albritton won the silver, Cornelius won the gold. Dave Albritton went to Ohio State like Jesse Owens, but Dave Albritton was not Jesse Owens. He was his roommate. So because he went to Ohio State, because he was Black, they thought he was Jesse Owens, which he was not. He was Dave Albritton of Ohio State and Cornelius Johnson of Los Angeles, who was at Compton College at that time. So um, that, that, that is what happened. Uh, Leticia has a question. She said that a mentor of hers is um, also a 1936 Olympian and that they had to raise their own funds to go to the Olympics. How did the majority of the 18 fund their participation to be able to, to attend? It, it, it varied. Some of them received donations. Some of them coaches paid for it. Louise Stokes, um, her town supported her, they, her church in particular. They had fundraisers and they donated. And what, uh, when they came up short, the mayor of Malden, Massachusetts, chipped in the rest of the money. So each of them had a different story on how um, they were able to get the money. It's not like now where, you know, the USOC funds the trip to the Olympics. Not only were they African-American, <laughs> they had to come up with their own money, which, you know, was kind of a, an extra thing that they had to do. They had to make the team and then they had to fund their trip to be able to represent the country. So um, quite, quite, quite remarkable that they even made the trip in the first place. Um, Eileen asked if uh, you happen to know, and this is, you know, outside of the, the Olympics that you were researching, but do you happen to know if the participation or experience of Black athletes changed by the 1948 Olympics in London? Well, I think a couple of things changed. I think the, the recruiting in the NCAA changed. So you're going to get more African Americans participating in the Olympics because you have more African Americans exposed uh, to college athletics, you had more coaches willing to uh, break from what at that time was status quo by being all white teams to recruit African Americans. So definitely their success wasn't just an Olympic success, it was a sports success. So you would see the integration of sports start to proliferate. Uh, I, I often say it's not a small coincidence that Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier and, and his brother ran in front of Hitler. It's not a small coincidence. And, and it's not a small coincidence that you begin to see tremendous integration just 10 years after what they accomplished in Berlin in 1936. There were a number of questions about the boycott. Um, and so one of them was, and I'll, I'll maybe try to smush some of them together for you. But one of them was uh, um, asking if any of the if any American athletes um, decided to boycott in spite of the vote to go. Um, and then was there any um, is there any dis was there any discussion kind of following up on the NAACP's um, opposition to um, to all to all of that? So I don't know if you can speak to both of those. I can. Um, there were a great bit of Jewish athletes. The entire Long Island basketball team chose not to go to the Olympics. There were um, a lot of courageous young Jewish athletes who made a decision. This is what they believed in. This is what they decided. They did not want to go to Germany um, and they did not go. And that was their point of resistance. That was their uh, ability to say, my voice matters, my presence matter, and I'm going to keep both my voice and my presence uh, in the United States and not go to Germany. But then you had, of course, Sam Stoller and Marty Glickman, who said, I'm going to go and I'm going to compete and I'm going to run in the relay. And then they were benched 
because they were Jewish. So, um, you know, and, and you have to think about it for a minute. You have to stop and think these politics are impact. These are young, you know, young college students, 18, 19, 20. They're in the middle of a huge global political contest, right? Um, let's not talk about the sports contest, the, the political contest that was going on. Uh, FDR was still practicing isolationism. So he understood what was happening. Um, but until it actually happened to us, we really didn't put our, our voice into this fight. Um, we, we, we were getting reports back from Germany. So we understood, maybe not everyone, but certainly the politicians understood what was happening and what could potentially happen. So um, the, the, the young students didn't have all the information, but in the case of the Long Island basketball team, they didn't need any more information. They had enough information to make the decision for themselves. Um, the NAACP, one of the reasons um, the NAACP, much like the Long Island basketball team, they their review of the situation was if we participate, we lend more credibility to the games being this amazing, uh, you know, dynamic presentation brought to you by the Third Reich. Um, they didn't want to buy into this propaganda, but they, but they actually after the games recognized that while it was indeed propaganda, the idea that these African-Americans defeated Aryan athletes, this was an important blow to the premise of inferiority. This is an important blow to being able to demonstrate we can beat the Third Reich. We can beat the Aryans. This is, this is not a force that we have to accept. So I, I, I think it's a tough decision, right? Um, because what do you do if you're 17 or 18 years old, right? How do you make that type of informed decision? How do you know if you have all of the facts? How do you know if what you're reading in the newspaper or what you're getting from the White House is accurate? And, and how do you know if the politicians are processing the information they have in your best interest or in the best interest of the country? So I think the young people on both sides of that argument made the very best decisions they could given the information they had. And it was very tough for the ones who decided not to go and for the ones who went because they didn't know what they were actually walking into. I'm going to shift gears a tiny bit because I see that we have some film students who are sending some questions as well. Um, so there's there's a couple of them, such you know, um, such as, um, did you use any footage from Lenny Riefenstahl's film Olympia, and how did she play into your research? Um, and then we had some other questions about you know how long did it take to research and actually create the film funding, things like that. So anything that you would like to, to share on that account would be great. Absolutely. Hello, fellow filmmakers. Glad to see you guys uh, here. Thank you for watching the film. Thank you for being here. Um, it was about four years of researching and making, you know, it's iterative, right? So you, you start your research and you're researching and you're, you're editing and shooting kind of all at once and in some ways until you get to the final product that you want. I think um, research is for me critical and not just telling uh, documentaries, but features as well. You want, you want to understand the time and place and the people and you want to get a good handle on that story and you want to be sure that you've investigated uh, primary source materials and interviewed enough people to be able to put together your outline to then build your script to then put your film together um, in, in the edit suite. Um, I, I think that, you know, going to Germany was really amazing and being able to interview people both in Germany and in America, but going to the 1936 Olympic Village and the stadium really helped crystallize how I wanted to tell the story um, as a filmmaker and, and as an artist. Um, and, and so that part was really, really important to me. The, the other parts of, of the process was really sitting down and understanding what this journey was like and how to paint the picture of that journey of 18 African-Americans in college in the 30s 
in the middle of the most incredible moment of political upheaval uh, of the last century. So, um, and, and then it was, it was kind of interesting too, because um, as a filmmaker, you have to make choices and decisions. And I didn't want to land on either side of the story. I just wanted to present the facts as best I could. So that those were the choices that I made as a filmmaker. What was the other two questions, Jessica? From the um, filmmaker? It, it was, um, let me double check. It was um, a little bit about funding and it was about the Olympia and how long it took. So about Lenny Riefenstahl and maybe the research that you did or using her footage. And I actually just saw another question about filmmaking, which, or, or about at least festivals. Have you um, shown this at any Jewish film festivals? Um, absolutely. I'll start there. We've shown it at maybe 15 Jewish film festivals around the country. Um, it's, it's, it's really um, been a great honor to be able to participate in cross-cultural conversations in Jewish film festivals and um, at Holocaust education centers and, and Jewish cultural centers. I think that's the beauty of this story is that this story is so cross-cultural. This is it's kind of transcultural in a way because it covers race, class, religion. It covers so many of these uh, demographic and psychographic data points that social scientists like to follow. So I, so I think that's great. And we did use Lenny Riefenstahl's footage. Yes, you can recognize some of Olympia in there. The funny thing about that is that um, the footage of the black athletes was left on the cutting room floor. So it's not technically in Olympia because the cut that she showed her benefactor who was Adolf Hitler, he asked for the black athletes to be removed. Um, so you won't see them in Olympia, but you will see them in Olympic Pride American Prejudice. Lenny Riefenstahl had 22 cameras on the ground. So that's why you, that, you know, when you're looking at that high jump footage, like how amazing is that footage to have been shot in 1936? That's actually how good of a director she was in 1936. So she had those those low, you know, the cameras low. She had cameras high. She she really did a great job in terms of sports coverage. So um, a lot of those techniques are still used today. So yes, that that is her footage, but not from Olympia. Then I just have a couple more questions, and one of them is asking about you know any modern day parallels that you might draw uh, to the film. Um, and so I, if you wanna address that, and then I actually, some it just popped up, uh, I see on, I kind of have two different, I have the chat and the Q and A, so I'm, I'm juggling them both. And I actually saw that there was another question, uh, if you don't mind going back to the boycott about kind of where you stand on the decision, what you, you know, what, do you agree with the, the decision, you know, that the US would participate um, during the Hitler administration? Um, I, I don't know as an athlete if I would have stayed home. As an athlete, I would have gone to Berlin. As a black athlete, I, I, I would have taken the opportunity to demonstrate that I am both human and capable and smart and, and able to stand toe to toe, face to face with the enemy and certainly someone who thinks I'm inferior, um, I would accept that challenge on any given Sunday. Yeah. And did you want to say anything about any modern day situations? Oh, I mean, you know, which, which modern day situation? There, there's so many to talk about. I, I, political upheaval, yes. An election year, 1936, an election year, 2020. Um, information, uh, hemorrhaging, uh, you know, information that the administration had in 1936 that was not shared with the American public. We probably can say that for 2020 as well. Information that the administration had that wasn't shared with the public. I think those are those are parallels. I think the need to demonstrate that uh, African American lives matter and the voices need to be heard and to be seen and to be recognized as equal in 1936, same as 2020. 1936 had a, had a significant amount of lynchings in 1936, even though Red Summer had been, you know, 
1918-1920, the numbers of lynchings in 1936, um, and the numbers of brutality uh, happening in 1936, 2020, same, same thing. I think what's also interesting is that Ralph Metcalf, when he was a congressman, he wrote a white paper on police brutality and violence and modern day lynchings. And I, and I find that interesting. So anyone interested in reading that should read Ralph Metcalf's paper on, on police brutality from the 70s. Um, it's pretty enlightening and it's also a great parallel to 2020. So um, I, I think it's uncanny and it actually, it, uh, the, the idea of the parallels, Jessica, are so great um, that it's actually slightly frightening. So I, Maybe uh, more slightly. We, yeah. So we have uh, just one more one more question, and um, the this person, and I believe this is a student as well, um, just wanted to know what your greatest learning moment was in the making of this film. And then Every after, I'm so sorry. After you're done, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Heron's going to come back to help us close out the evening. You know what? Every moment was a learning moment. I think every time we create something, I mean, I, I love to learn. I just have to be honest. Um, so I love learning. I love exploring. I'm incredibly curious. So every step of making this film and writing this book, all six years of that, of that contribution to make the, making these two pieces of art live, Every day was a learning experience. You make mistakes, you learn from them. Um, I think one of the things that I like about myself is I make a decision and, and I'm gonna make the decision. Now, two steps into it, I might be like, oh, that was wrong. Um, that was an error, my bad. But I made the decision so I can back up and redirect or course correct. So I, so I think that's really important. I think it's important to make a decision and it might be wrong, it might be right, but either way you learn from it and, and you make a better decision next time and a better decision the next time and you keep getting better. I think um, learning is so important. And I think um, being married to your craft, whatever that craft is and wanting to be really great at it is important. Um, the other thing that I learned is that we all have a unique voice and we get to use it. Um, you know, Dr. Heron, Jessica, the three of us, people see the three of us, we all get to bring something great to the story of Olympic pride, American prejudice. You, whether you're teaching it in a classroom or you're creating this platform for people to um, receive this information, it takes a great village to move information from the creator or from the artist to the community and to make it a part of culture. And you need all of those people and all of those places and all of those parts. So um, I think that's important. Um, and, I, and I absolutely love telling stories um, that are, you know, unknown. I love telling stories about African-American heroes. Um, it makes me incredibly proud. It makes me um, feel that I'm contributing something significant and something that will hopefully create an opportunity for dialogue and for people to understand that, you know, all those little data points that scientists like to say, all the big data, all the analytics, when you look at it, honestly, they're universal truths that we all share. And underneath all of these things that people like, you know, race, color, gender, sexual orientation, when you take all of that away, we're just the human race. And we all want to feel loved. We all want to feel included. We all share you know, the same emotions. You know, we want to laugh, we cry sometimes. Things are funny, things are sad. Sometimes we're afraid, sometimes we're uh, joyful, sometimes we're triumphant. That does not uh, change <laughs> if your race is different. Uh, we share that and, and I think um, a great reminder is humanity. When I was making this film and when I made uh, Versailles 73, uh, sometimes you know, distributors think, oh gosh, an African-American documentary won't travel. People in other countries aren't gonna get it. Well, they did, they do, they like it, they watch it, they wanna share it. So we are not different, we're the same. And, and our lived experiences 
that are slightly different, uh, when we bring them all together, it makes for a great dinner party. Um, even if it's virtual, it makes for a wonderful experience and great friendships. And that's what I'm most grateful for, for making this film. Well, Deborah, you know, I know you're in Atlanta. I know it's three hours uh, later and you've been wonderful about staying to uh, respond to, to, I think I agree with you, some very good uh, questions. And, you know, I kind of, uh, I guess this is like a early, early alert for those who've stuck with us until the last, uh, which is to say that when we can all be together again, and hopefully that is going to be sooner rather than later in person, we definitely want you to come in person to Chapman and whether you screen this film or the screen a future film that I know you're working on. Um, we want you to come and really be part of our Chapman community for as many days as we can pry you free from all the other things that, that you're doing. Now, if you're, if you're lucky and you're a member of the Chapman community, you actually get to continue uh, the conversation with Deborah at uh, uh, on Friday at one o'clock as part of the engaging the world, leading the conversation on the significance of race uh, by Wilkinson College. And Dean Jennifer Keene will uh, be moderating that Q&A session. Uh, and then lastly, after especially thanking Deborah, I wanna thank all the rest of you for being here tonight and ask you, invite you to join us for our uh, next event, which will be in memory of Chris Dalnock, the Night of Broken Glass, on Monday, November 9th at six o'clock. It will uh, be a program that will include brief uh, readings by students representing several of the religious traditions we have on campus, uh, reflections, and then there is going to be a very bizarre symmetry to this event and the event we've had tonight, which you had to be here tonight to see the symmetry. So you're all, all one step ahead of, of everyone else. We're going to have an author named Timothy Boyce, who is going to be talking about a little known Norwegian resistance member not Jewish, who was imprisoned in Sachsenhausen concentration camp, the camp that was being built at the same time as the 1936 Olympics were going on, who not only kept a 600 page secret diary, which is a story in its own right, but he, this Norwegian prisoner also saved the life of a 10-year-old Jewish boy who had actually already survived almost impossibly the death march from Auschwitz and who would be so inspired by the humanity of this Norwegian prisoner in the most inhumane of places that he would go on later in his adult life to become a world famous advocate for human rights and a judge on the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So there's something about, as Deborah said so well tonight, the power of story and how it connects us to one another and inspires us in ways that would never happen otherwise. So I know in my teaching, I have certainly been inspired by this film and by Deborah. She is now, I hope, a part of Chapman. And it, we look forward to the next time to welcome you back, Deborah. It, it, it's, it's my pleasure. And um, I, I want everyone who's still on to, to really know what a great job you guys did. Um, Jessica, thank you so very much. Dr. Heron, thank you 
um, for inviting me and welcoming me and making me feel a part of, of your uh, family at Chapman. I definitely feel that. And I will definitely be on campus as soon as I can get there and as soon as it's safe. Um, but the work you do is incredibly important. And um, thank you for choosing this film and having the courage to do it virtually. I love it. So take care. Well, a kudos to Jessica and also to Jeremy, but especially to Jessica, who is the mastermind and our tech guru and uh, one of those unsung heroes of Chapman, who's definitely deserves to have a lot of songs written about her, but not by me, because I'm a really crummy songwriter. But with that, thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Jessica, Jeremy, and we'll sign off for this event. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you.